Welcome, everybody. I'm pleased to have Robert here on the channel today. Um, we met a couple of months ago, the first time in Beijing, where we stayed in a hotel and we're discussing about a couple of topics that we might hit today as well. Uh, the Chinese economy, I think it will be very valuable to you as a viewer if you're interested in Chinese stocks or China in particular, um, and maybe also a little bit of geopolitics. Um, I think uh, the, the context here is that in the last couple of uh, weeks and months, investors are questioning whether or not China uh, is still an interesting um, yeah, geolocation for investing and what's the future holding for China. And uh, we just had the third plenum. And I want to bring on Robert here because I think he's got some very interesting um, views on that. And so without further ado, I want to dive into that. Um, please, Robert, um, explain in your own words uh, what you are doing um, in China, uh, who you are, and then I will have a couple of questions for you. Hi, Marcel. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, this is Robert Wu. Um, I am a CEO of a data research company called Big One Lab. And we are also a publisher of several newsletters uh, one of which is called Baiguan, uh, mm. where we provide uh, contextualized data-driven insights about Chinese market and Chinese economy. Yeah, awesome. So um, it's exactly that I noticed your um, the newsletter that you're writing, as well as some of your public comments around uh, the, your views of the third plenum. I saw you've been arguing with others um, online. Um, with their views versus yours. So that's what we're going to talk about now. But maybe just first, as you, somebody on the ground, as an entrepreneur, as you just said, and a business owner, yeah. how's the feeling currently locally in China? Um, how are things going for you? Uh, maybe just some sentiment from your side. Yeah, uh, to be to be frank, to be honest, I think this is, we are entering a period um, of, I would say, I would characterize it as a recession. Um, mm -hmm. And it will be the worst recession uh, that I have personally witnessed. Um, I I think maybe somewhere around 1997, 1998 during the Asian financial crisis, the things could be even harder. But I was too young to experience anything. But post the uh, in the 21st century, in the last two to three decades, I would think this is maybe the worst period in terms of the consumer sentiment, in terms of business sentiment. Uh, but that's the prevailing sentiment. Uh, for me, though, um, I'm I'm still fairly optimistic about the long-term um, potential and success of this country. I, I I'm not in the camp to believe that the China story is over. Um, we do have many structural problems. We have facing a lot of issues that uh, I think our generation and the future generations are still in a position to try to fix. So that's, I think, the summarization of where we are now and uh, what we could be doing in the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very interesting. So maybe also to provide some context, um, previously on the channel here, I've been always arguing that I don't see China stimulating its economy um, un until just around uh, the third plenum, where I said, you know, we had some bad economic data coming in. Um, uh, the main argument for me was that some uh, now uh, suddenly the uh, GDP growth data is, for example, lower than the publicly stated goals. And so I said, well, now it's becoming more likely, actually, in my views, that something might happen and it might not be actually the third plenum because that's possibly not the plenum in order to announce, let's say, short term stimulus, mm -hmm. um, but maybe around these couple of months and weeks. And what we actually got indeed was a, a rate cut and we also um, got some other um, short-term measures that I already spoke about here on a channel. However, I think the, the whole sentiment here around the third plenum is, first of all, there has been very low expectations going into the plenum that there is actually something substantial happening here. And the second part is that um, after the plenum, I think the main takeaway was still like, okay, it's a disappointment. Um, China did not announce big things. Um, and um, yeah, we're kind of stuck in this narrative somehow. So maybe you can start uh, talking a little bit from your views, uh, what happened in the third plenum? How do you contextualize uh, this meeting? And uh, then we can go a little bit deeper. 
This is a very good, great question. Um, as you just pointed out, the third plenum of the 20th Central Committee of Communist Party of China is not an occasion for uh, working on short-term fixes of anything. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's one of it's, it's it's supposed to be the most important plenum every five to ten years, and it's where these important issues are being discussed, ironed out, and uh, decided. Um, so so when we talk about the significance of a plenum, we will need to talk about the problems that we are facing today, the real mm -hmm. uh, problem. Um, I would characterize um, three biggest problems, and these are interconnected. Um, the first one, I think the first one, which is, I think, is the, the, the most important one, is that uh, we have a local government system that is on the verge of being bankrupt. Um, it's just we don't allow bankruptcy of local governments in China, but if it's a free market, you will see many local governments in China are being bankrupt. Um, and that's because the real estate market in China, the whole machine of uh, the whole model of building and urbanizing and, um, and extracting revenues from land and selling houses and housing price goes up, this whole model that is the good, the, the plus side is this model provides um, a, a, a Chinese model of urbanization really fast within less than three decades. But the downside of that, there's only so much you can build. And if you have a local government that is too hooked on to this idea of selling property, um, you will face one day that there will be no more property to sell and the prices will go down and you will lose a big chunk of your revenue. Um, and I think also it's important because uh, the way, the role that local government play in a Chinese economy is so much bigger than say your local city councils, your, your, your province government play in your economy. Um, local government in China play a, as high as a role as consumers, as businesses. It's a fundamental part uh, in the whole Chinese ecosystem. So while I think the Chinese consumers they still have potential. The Chinese businesses, they still have potential. The Chinese central government, they still are well, very well funded. But there's a big missing link here, which is local government. They are the actual arms of execution of the government system in China. It's what businesses and the consumers face on a daily basis. That whole sector, you can say they're in a real crisis. And the problem now is how to fix this crisis, how to get local governments out of this place without pumping more money into the real estate market. So I think that's question number one. I mean, problem number one. Problem number two, as you pointed out, is the lack of um, domestic demand. Mm -hmm. um, it used not to be such a big problem because uh, before, uh, even if consumer demand is um, less from um, satisfactory, uh, you could still rely on, first of all, investment, government investment, and second of all, the external demand, the exports to drive e economic growth. Um, but as I just said, the government sector is going down. Um, external demand, um, while doing better, um, we are still see more and more trade barriers coming up. And also there's a question of whether the global demand will be shrinking soon, right? So, mm -hmm. so without these two engines, uh, the, the, the usual problem, the long standing problem of lack of domestic demand in China becomes more and more uh, pronounced as a problem. So that's problem number two. How do you fix that? How do you um, stimulate people to, to, to consume more, to spend more? And there's a real deflationary spiral right now. Uh, people are spending more in terms of physical volume. Uh, they're actually buying more stuff. Uh, but uh, but uh, in terms of prices they pay, it's definitely going down, right? If you look at the, uh, the recent results of Yum China, for example, the operator of KFC, largest restaurant chain in China, uh, you can see that their same, same store growth rate, 
in terms of do dollar amount is negative 4%, while their same, same store volume rate is actually positive 4%. Mm. Uh, so meaning an ASP decline of 8%, meaning people are having more chicken, they're just paying less, right? Mm. Um, so, 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 so that's how do you, how do you reverse that trend? How do you reverse that expectation? Um, is the big problem. The final problem, which I think is the one that is highlighted the most by um, uh, domestic policymakers for the last couple of years, which I also think are interconnected with the other two, is the point about uh, our lack of so-called total factor productivity growth. Mm -hmm. Um, meaning our economic growth that can be attributed to technological innovation, uh, to innovation in our uh, policies, in our systems, the mechanisms, you know, all these intangible growth that is not coming from either capital growth or labor growth. Uh, China has a total factor productivity or T. Uh, FP growth that is stagnating for more than a decade. Mm. The last decade of growth in China has been filled by debt, has been filled by overinvestment in either real estate or in generic manufacturing, right? Um, and you you kind of see that tied up to like say the first problem, right? Because we we depend so much on on these overinvestment, these government overinvestment. Uh, the focus has not been paid attention to technology, has not been paid attention to TFP growth. Uh, so how do you grow that? Um, so I think I, I see these three as the most important tasks that uh, the, the party leadership they want to address. And I, unlike many other people, I do think the plenum is doing a good job at addressing mm -hmm. these three. Um, okay. Yeah. Do you think so, they have any any focus between those three, or maybe in your own words, where do you maybe you can give some examples, yeah, or where sure. you think Definitely. is if there is a focus on which of those um, yeah. um, in the aftermath of the third plenum? Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's something. Uh, I think the what what they should do better, which is to explain their rationale better and to prioritize. Um, when you see the document. Uh, 22,000 Chinese characters of document. Mm. You don't actually see a focus, a priority that mm -hmm. well. Um, they structure in a way that they think is systematic, is complete, but actually not each one of the 300 uh, decisions are equal. Um, maybe some of them are, some of them are just cliche, but they still have to pay attention to, right? But there are real things, so I think I think the real focus of the three uh, of the three problems I mentioned, the real focus uh, is first. So first of all, the the local government situation. Mm. There has been some really revolutionary or big change, um, at least in terms of language of this document when it comes to local government. Uh, it specifically uh, points to a future where more and more of the physical resources will be shifted from the central government to the local government. Mm -hmm. um, it's specifically, it basically it's a, it's a big readjustment of the central local government relationship ever since I would say the two, uh, 1994 tax reform uh, to just provide a context to our audience. So the 1994 tax reform, uh, before that, before 1994, about 80% of the tax revenues in China, they went to the local governments. The central government, they actually, you know, even if you imagine China to be a big unified country with a very strong state, but by 1994, central government is actually borrowing money from the local governments. Mm. Um, and the whole situation is not sustainable and it actually contributes to a lot of the social problems. For example, hyper um, over investment at the local governments and also the hyperinflation due to that, which many people believe the hyperinflation in the late 1980s actually contributed a lot to the, you know, we all know the political unrest by the end of the 80s. Um, so there was a big reform in 1994, very tough reform where 
uh, central government basically centralize all the physical resources and redistribute to the local governments. So that was a big kind of reset in this relationship, which I, I, I believe is the most important relationship in the Chinese society, the one between the, 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 the top, the central government and the local governments. The 3,000 counties, the 300 cities, the 80,000 something, uh, the, the, the 20 some thousand something townships all across China, their relationship with the, with Beijing. Mm -hmm. um, so that was 1994. And because local governments, they suddenly have a, a loss of revenue, they become to rely more on the land sale model, which is basically selling mm -hmm. the land uh, for developers to develop. They, they get the most of the revenue out and they develop. Uh, so that that tax reform is directly linked with the real estate development model that we had for the last three decades. And, and now, because we all know real estate market is not there anymore, or it's mm -hmm. not, it will never come back to where it was. Mm -hmm. um, they just had a sudden loss of revenue and basically a same reset of local central relationship is on the table now as, as as significant as the 1994 reform. And, and in this period, you will witness more of the physical resources shifting back to local governments. Uh, and also the responsibilities, many of the responsibilities will be shifted up. Um, so, so basically central government, uh, the party leadership, they, they specifically said that the central government will need to shoulder more responsibilities, uh, do more tasks. And also there is the big uh, part about the so-called consumption tax reform. I know tax is always boring, but this one is really fascinating because mm -hmm. uh, consumption tax in China uh, used to be um, a, a production side tax counterintuitively. They mm -hmm. don't charge the tax at consumption side. They charge at the production side. Um, that's for one thing. Second thing is, all of the consumption tax, they go directly to the central government. Local government have no cut out of it at all. And this time they specifically said that they will move consumption tax to the retail end, to the final end. And also will let gradually let local governments to enjoy this part of the tax. And this whole thing is very significant. It, although it's just one line, but it's, it's very significant if you understand the context. Before that, local governments, they, they have uh, all of these production taxes. So what they will do, they will subsidize production. They will attract businesses to set up factories over there. And we just subsidize more, subsidize more so that they can have more revenues and they charge more you know, value add taxes on that. So this whole thing becomes very production driven. Mm -hmm. But once you subsidize, once, once you allow local governments to get their cut of consumption, it will be different. And then you will think about all kinds of ways that the local governments will subsidize consumption now, or in some indirect subsidies, for example, invest in healthcare services, invest in education services, where consumers can have less pressure to consume. They don't say directly that we are promoting a consumer focused society now. But the line there will set in motion inevitably many things. Just think about in 1994, the tax reform set in motion the whole real estate development model. This reform here will also set in motion of a very different style of uh, model. Wow, yeah, this is super fascinating. And also because you mentioned the interconnectedness, this is directly, it's solving the local, the first point, the local government issue yeah. structurally, yeah. and it's connected yeah. to the second point, the demand side, right? But yeah, as you say, like not very explicit, but it's changing the fundamentals for it, like the, the way the connections are uh, and uh, the flywheels are working, right? Exactly. Well, I want to add to that, the, like, for example, on the demand side, there are two ways you can do this. One is the way that, that I just mentioned, you fix the structural uh, uh, kind of imbalances, and then you stimulate. The other way mm -hmm. is cater to whatever demand by the people who don't know about these and just stimulate. Like, for example, now, if you just stimulate, you're just handing the cash to people in China. 
So the first question is, who does this? Who implements this policy? Most likely, it will fall on the shoulders of local governments, because local governments are the real government. I mean, in terms of executing policies in China. 99% of public employees work for local governments, not the central governments, not the people you see on news, the Beijing people. It's all the local governments, right? But then you hand out the cash to the local governments. Um, where, where do the cash go? The cash may go to the residents, but the local governments will not care. I mean, they spend more, but local governments will still be bankrupt. That thing just doesn't flow because the because the you know the, the the model that worked before didn't work now, and you cannot just do it, uh, you know, using the textbook Western economics mm. uh, to to solve it. There are many underlying things that need to be fixed, and that's also a great explanation as to why we are always hearing the when will China stimulate and nothing's happening because. As you just explained, you first need to set the settings and it's actually going not the way that we would expect with a big bazooka type of stimulus, but you just explained the new mechan mechanism that they hopefully um, can successfully yeah. enable to work and then uh, things will gradually start flowing in the, in the right way. Yeah, regarding the bazooka stimulus, I think one thing that is... Uh, holding back is for sure the, um, the what I just what I just mentioned. The necessary reforms are not in place. As yeah. of now, the necessary reforms are just announced. They have not been you know actually implemented yet. So it will take some time. But there are also other factors. I think, for example, uh, you know we are still at a stage where the the Fed Re Federal Reserve they're still maintaining a very high interest rate. Yeah. Um, I think Chinese policymakers are keenly aware of the geopolitical competition, the struggles, the risks here, if the Fed is maintaining a high rate while the Chinese side is maintaining a very low rate, it could be destructive to both the currency and the economy. Um, but I think these are understandable. Um, you, you can, it's kind of suicide if, if you do a bazooka style uh, kind of stimulus. While, while there's a high pressure overseas. Mm -hmm. Unless if they either they lower the interest rate, I mean the Fed, or and or um, the global economy is also entering a more recessionary uh, period, uh, yes. shutting down the external demand for Chinese economy. Um, I think these developments will make, uh, will give policymakers in China more room to respond. Yeah, interesting. I mean, we're currently, on the verge of those things to happen. We don't know yet. Exactly. Um, however, that seems exactly also uh, one thing to wait for and see the outcome. Uh, another one is possibly the election in the US in November, which might give us, or also the Chinese leaders and uh, decision makers, a little bit of more outlook, what the geopolitics might look like in the future, or uh, the US economy, which, by the way, is obviously also, as you said, an important demand driver for Chinese goods still, yeah. despite everything, right? So, um, yes. yeah, these. This is possibly one of the explanations why we don't see those huge announcements on, from a Western type of thinking anyways. But uh, I think as you just well explained already, um, there are different thinking, different contexts, different mechanics in China. You cannot just uh, apply the Western type of thinking and solution. And that's mostly how the Western media and investors are actually trying to look at things. And that's why it's not working out or uh, there's a mismatch somehow also that we see reflected right. in these online discussions. Maybe to the third point, uh, what you're seeing there um, as possible solutions. Yeah. 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 I think um, for the third one, um, the resolve of the government has been more clear. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's actually the one that outside observers emphasize more on. Um, and I think there are interesting ideas from the third plenum, although I'm less sure about the efficacy of it. Mm -hmm. the, the most interesting idea, I think, which is, I think, the most necessary idea is to let, to give freedom to the researchers, to the scientists, to the entrepreneurs mm -hmm. to innovate and to have more say uh, in the whole process, right? Uh, I think that's a very interesting idea and, and it's everywhere in the third plenum. Uh, it's a very clear direction from, at least from the central government perspective, 
although I'm less sure about the efficacy of it, it's because just uh, conceptually, it's a little bit hard to, uh, you know, give more freedom uh, from the top down. Yeah. Um, it's um, it's not as if um, when once, once you know the the top boss said uh, scientists should be have more freedom, then they will have more freedom. Um, I think what it will take more is to um, actually have some brave people um, on the on the ground doing some really good in- experiments. Um, and I think if you look back at the reform in China back in the 870s and early 80s, it's a combination of top-down will, but, L- L- but also a bottom-up grassroots experimentation. You know, a lot of things are risky. Um, even if you have a line in the top level document in China, it doesn't guarantee that you will be safe for whatever thing you do, right? Mm-hmm. If you look at the histories, if you look at the stories of that period of time, you see a lot of these grassroots level struggle between the innovators and the more conservative type, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think we will need to see more of that uh, okay. for, for this kind of reform to be actually meaningful. Um, mm-hmm. At the end of the day, it's about giving more uh, freedom and space to the grassroots level uh, units, be it mm-hmm. companies, be it research institu- institutes, be it uh, you know scientists and innovators themselves. Um, so we need to 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 look more closely like, uh, at that. It will be less uh, less. E- I mean, it will be more difficult than the the previous two. I think in terms mm-hmm. of the, the 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 capacity of the government to achieve anything. Yeah, it kind of reflects a little bit a discussion that I had in Shenzhen with one of a, a CFO of a publicly listed company who also mentioned like uh, we're waiting for a signal of Beijing basically to, you know, for the whole entrepreneurship um, field to, you know, have this, I don't know, like go signal and go out there again and uh, feeling hungry and uh, that sort of thing. Yeah. But what I'm seeing just... Um, Occasionally, like in, you know, we see endorsement of educational companies. I think that's also been in there in a third plenum um, yeah. on video streaming. Uh, some of these uh, sectors where we had those crackdowns in the past were, uh, you know, tighter regulation and so on, where we now see games being approved again and so on. So I do see some signals there, but uh, as you may have explained, there might be something more on the emotional side or a big guy or a, a, such kind of a key message, some some sort of a key events necessary in order to kind of uh, start the real, um, yeah. the real run yeah. again. It, it, it's possible that this part won't come from the top to down. Maybe yeah. it could be something spontaneous and, mm-hmm. uh, and it, and, and, and it, 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 it kind of aroused imagination, excitement, and mm-hmm. it got proved from the mm. top maybe that's the way it works maybe a little bit what i'm seeing there around like with jack ma coming back to hangzhou and uh, going public buying alibaba stock publicly also the, uh, <laughs> the the founding team all around that that's kind of maybe a little bit into that um yeah. uh, idea Just a little already. Bit yeah. yeah 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 all right maybe um yeah i've already taken almost half an hour of your time it's a very good overview and i think lots of um new insights into this third plenum discussion in my point of view um and i think uh you yeah you mentioned how uh, you know beneath all of these discussions uh, there is actually quite a bit in there that is worthy discuss uh, to discuss and maybe we can go uh, into that deeper in another interview next time um maybe on the whole macro uh context side about this idea of china switching away from real estate to high tech and or new growth areas uh what do you make of this idea of the new productive forces in in china that i think have been kind of yeah. giving the, the next goal where china is headed um is that already clear to you and to your community of innovators and is everybody aligned with that or do you think this takes a little bit more time and uh, what how would you define that yeah uh, i to be honest the the so-called new quality production productive forces is just a term they use to to say that we need to increase our tfp yeah the 
total factor productivity. You know, anything that can increase that, anything that can let our grow independent of capital and labor growth will be characterized as uh, new quality productive forces. It's, it's basically a, a term that we just created to grab everyone's imagination and focus to that area. Um, and I think there, there is definitely a lot that we should do. Uh, there's a lot of the work that we need to catch up on. Um, if you look at the, the past uh, one decade, the, 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 the many of the growth areas are creatures of capital. Um, so it be it internet companies, which needs a lot of capital to, to, to build uh, and to subsidize and to create these platform economies. Or if you look at the new energy uh, sector, like solar panels. So it, a lot of the growth is not driven by technological growth. Some, it does play a role, but most mm. of it is from the scale. The, mm. the, 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 the just, uh, you know, invest more, have more scale and the economy of scale takes care of the rest, right? Um, there, in terms of true innovation, in terms of, um, you know, better technology, higher efficiency, um, and in terms of groundbreaking innovation, um, and also in terms of um, these top level tech that China has not been able to achieve yet, like mm. you know, high end chip making and all that, uh, we are we're still lagging behind a lot. And I think there is a consensus uh, among both the uh, the people who are happy with this and also among the people who are not happy at this moment that that we do need to um, kind of kind of um, relearn. Uh, or catch up on what we have not uh, pay attention to enough. Mm. Um, yeah, so so I, 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 I'm personally optimistic about that. It's just um, the way um, it's uh, the, 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 the time it would take to achieve that is really uncertain. I don't see it in the near future, but I think there is a general consensus to just keep pushing in that regard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my last question would be uh, around the chances of China succeeding with that, uh, with these goals, uh, you know, what they have stated in the third plenum, how they're changing things, but also with the new productive forces and so on. Um, you know, China is just one part of this whole ecosystem on a global context. Yeah. And uh, we have obviously US lawmakers going on record and basically saying, you know, it wouldn't be bad if China went through some economic struggles because this may actually even challenged them significantly and you know there's like there's a force working against china currently in terms of yeah. cutting uh, like this whole decoupling uh cutting um supply chains cutting um, economic relations and so on so are you still optimistic that china can work its way out given this context or do you worry about that this might be actually a way of um you know keeping china essentially down in a sense yeah, I think at the end of the day, when you look at the, the rise and fall of great nations, um, it all comes down to the, the quality and the, and the spirit of the generations uh, mm -hmm. that, 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 that the society currently have, right? Um, I think it's, it's hard to, for China to switch so quickly from a uprising, enterprising nation to a point where we just give it up and say, oh no, let's just stop it. Um, uh, if you just look at the people around, you know, my generation, the post nineties, and if you look at the, even the younger ones, the post, uh, the, 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 the millennials, the Gen Zs, um, you do see, you know, brightness in their eyes. I mean, this may be not so scientific or concrete, but, but it's real, um, mm. I think it's it's uh, we are still at a place where the majority of our country we are hardworking we we want to achieve more collectively and individually um and and once you have that i, I don't think there's anything you know externally that can stop um the the, the rise um it just it, country succeed and not on their own um, it has always been like that. No external force can can determine um, whether you will be 
successful or not. So I think if you just look at the, this internal dynamic, this energy within, um, I have high hope. And that's actually my fundamental hope, uh, where my hope is fundamentally based on uh, the general spirit of this country is still quite young. Uh, we, are, we are still trying to achieve more. Fantastic closing works. Uh, thanks so much for your time, Robert. Where can people go and follow you and find your uh, commentary and works uh, aside from our next interview? <laughs> uh, yeah, so we have two newsletters. Thank you. One is the baiguan.news. This is the company newsletter. And I actually also keep a personal newsletter called chinatranslated.com, uh, where I provide my personal uh, reviews of the events that I think are important in China usually weekly review. Yeah. And also you're active on LinkedIn, right? Uh, uh, yes. People can find you there. And uh, I guess also sometimes on X. So I'll, I'll link yeah. your uh, uh, ways to reaching out uh, in, in the details of this video. And then, yeah, thanks everybody for joining today. Let me know in the comments how you liked our discussion and where you would like to um, yeah, go, um, have us go deeper in the next session. Um, thanks for watching and thanks to you, Robert. Enjoy your you. uh, rest of the day in Beijing and see you next time. Thanks.